by the way, who has my badge? Please give it to me before tonight. I have yours, so you, it's safe. But I mean, it'd be nice if I go home and it's not, I don't take pictures of Yvette's badge because no one's going to believe me. So yeah, um, I'm Raffaele Zidori. I do a whole bunch of stuff. And before I start though, I want to I wanna thank the organizer for having me. And I want to thank Yoast once again because they have been my sponsors on some of my uh, war camps, also known as the Zeta Tour. Uh, and um, Yoast has a diversity fund that allows people that couldn't otherwise get to war camps to be at war camps. So if there's any value today in my talk, uh, please also be grateful for Yoast. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here, which maybe would be better, but I don't know that. You'll tell me later. So let's get going. Um, I need to look at my slides, otherwise this is going to be stand-up comedy for two hours. Uh, so I want to get three points across to you today. Uh, first thing, what a brand is and what a brand is not. The second thing is going to be how we got to what today we call branding, which it's, you know, it's a long story. And then I'm going to share with you my recipe as a brand designer um, to create or to strengthen your own brands. And since we're having a hackathon and we're working with no profits, I've added a specific little bit dedicated to that. So let's go. So how many of you, few, <laughs> um, are here, uh, know what the term brands refers to or think they do? Show hands, show hands. Don't be shy, they see me, not you. Well, not a lot of you, that's okay, that's good. Uh, so according to the American Marketing Association Dictionary, which we're gonna take as like the Bible, a brand is a name, term, design symbol, or any other future, uh, feature, so the overall experience, that identifies one seller's good or service as distinct from those of other sellers of goods or services. So what is often improperly, pet peeve, uh, referred to as a brand? This is not a brand. A logo is not a brand. Uh, how many of you, you can fess up, you know, how many of you have used the term brand to refer to a logo or vice versa? Okay, okay, be brave, okay. So they're not. A brand is not a logo and a logo is not a brand. Uh, and I'm gonna show you exactly what I mean. So what is this? But what, who is this? Okay, let me rephrase that. That's Nike, right? Uh, that's Nike. Uh, the attitude, the vision, the style. Uh, this is Nike's declared mission, to bring inspiration and innovation to every athlete in the, word, in the world. And then there's an asterisk that says, if you have a body, you are an athlete. So this is Nike's logo, but this is Nike's brand. Let me show you another example. Who knows what this symbol stands for? Right, so this is a logo, but this is the New Zealand's All Blacks brand, right? The haka and the fact that you don't want to meet them pissed off at night, also kind of. Uh, so a logo is a representation. It's an icon. It's a symbol of a set of intangible values that set a company or a service or a person apart from somebody else. And the brand is that set of intangible values. The emotions, the vibe, uh, the hate, the like, the dislike, the what you feel. So to borrow from Anne Handley, who borrowed from Z. Frank, the brand is the emotional aftertaste that comes after an experience with a product or a service or a company 
a person or an entity. So you can think of the logo as the two-dimensional representation of a multi-dimensional experience, which is the brand. So every single one of these marks can evoke feelings, um, maybe bad ones, in which case you might want to work on your brand, but still, you know, they are an icon of something that is much more deeper and important and valuable. So how did we get here? The first practice of branding can be traced back to 50,000 years ago. Its purpose, rather obviously, was to establish what belonged to whom. So cane paintings um, in the Lascaux Caves in the south of France, which are the oldest that we have found, suggest that early men might have marked cattle and utensils with symbols drawn in paint or tar. So all properties that were considered precious were branded with the marking of the owner. By 2700 BC, owners switched to a more permanent method, burning. In fact, the term branding comes from the Norse, the Old Norse term brander, which means to burn. And the oldest documented practice of hot, of hot iron branding is found in Egyptian funeral documents and monuments that date back to 5,000 years ago. So then we have established ownership. Now the next thing that branding did was to establish a product's origin. Branding good, a bit like labels, transferred the information as to who, where, and to which, with which material some goods were made. And we can consider this the closest application to the term of what we mean today and the notion of brand as reputation. This practice was worldwide spread. Uh, there's traces in India, Greece, Rome, Mesopotamia, and China. Some of the earliest smart pottery dates uh, back more than 5,000 years. I thought it was oversized, and ignore me. And I love this. Archaeologists have identified about 1,000 unique potter's marks that, was, that were used during the first three centuries of the Roman Empire, which means that there was about 1,000 shops. And I can imagine people going, ooh, you know, I just bought this from Marius Ficus, you know, and I think he's so much better than Titus uh, Potterus, whatever. And, I, you know, this is... 2,000 years ago. I mean, this is quite cool. Um, so, moving forward, in the Middle Ages, guilds began using marks to distinguish their products and property. So, paper makers and printing houses used watermarks like this, and stonemasons and quarries developed an elaborate system to identify their work. Artists had always used symbols to identify their work. But in the Renaissance, artists like Michelangelo, rather than use symbols, started saying, I want to put my name on it. I want to make sure that people know I made that. And so he, this is in the Pietà in Rome. And this act introduced a new type of branding, which was authorship and the first notion of personal branding. Fast forward to the 1800s and the Industrial Revolution. Mass production of generic goods meant that these products, which were all basically the same, needed to be distinguished because they were all basically alike. So the first attempt at doing that was through the crates that were used to transport, which were hot iron branded, and they were soon followed by the personalization of the product's container itself. Uh, in the early 1900s, in fact, uh, we start seeing the birth of what we today call packaging design, and also of the modern concept of branding. 
So by the late 1800s, on the legal side, companies had begun investing a lot in branding and started recognizing its intrinsic value. So they demanded a way to protect those investments from competitors. So in 1862, the Merchandise Marks Act made it a criminal offense to imitate another's trademark with intent to defraud or to enable another to defraud. And in 1875, the Trademark Registration Act allowed formal registration of trademarks in the UK. So now a mark was, or a logo, uh, became a valuable asset and a brand became something that you could sell, own and sell and transfer. So many new brands entering the market and so many parity products, companies needed to you know, further differentiate and convince people that their product was better than their competitors. That's where advertising comes in. In the early 1900s, advertising it was relatively new and underused, uh, but a man named James Walter Thompson had a far-sighted vision. His advertising agency was the first one to establish a creative department to design content for clients. And he had a clear vision. So to support that and to sell the concept of advertising to clients, he wrote two books. He was in a really great copywriter because he called them the Red and Blue Thompson books of advertising, which is not exactly, you know. Um, but in them, there were two guides dedicated to clients that explained the values of creating a brand. In them, he also introduced the concept of trade ad trademark advertising, which is basically an early definition of what today we call branding. Obviously, advertising needs a medium to be carried by, so its evolution follows tightly that of the available communication technology. So the first advertising budget were spent on newspapers, ads, and radio spots. And between the 40s and the 50s, television became the game changer. Let's see if this is going to work. America runs on Boulevard time. Creative, right? So this was the first ever TV commercial aired. It lasted nine seconds. It was 1941. By 1952, TV ad revenue surpassed magazine and radio ad sales combined. Bringing in, you know, the golden age of advertising, which was made popular by Mad Men. In the 50s and 60s, advertising evolves from a unique selling proposition to an emotional selling proposition. In the 50s, the product is the core differential. So all advertising needs to communicate is that it exists and what you can use it for. Hi, I'm a toothpaste. You can, you know, brush your teeth and have nice teeth. But with so many parity products, um, the practice evolved to a further way to differentiate, which is an emotional selling proposition. And so the messaging becomes emotional in an effort to give products a personality, but also to pull the emotional strings of the consumer. In the 70s and 80s, we see the rise of mass media communication and the integration of all media in the budget. So advertising is done through TV, magazine, radio, and billboards. In the 70s, TV sets are now common. They permeate society. Consumers have become very brand conscious. Brands have become a status symbol. And by the 80s, the formula for winning is clear, a good campaign and massive spending on all available media. 
An example of an excellent advertising campaign is the Marlboro Man, first conceived by Leo Burnett in 1954 as a way to popularize filtered cigarettes to men, which at the time were considered feminine. The campaign ran from 1954 to 1999. It is considered one of the most brilliant advertising campaigns of all times. It transformed a mild lady's cigarette into a rough, ultra-masculine accessory in a matter of months. Marlboro sales increased 300% in the two years after the ad debuted in 1955. And the Marlboro man did that through the simple insight that a person's cigarette could, could speak to his or her self-image. Now, mind you, please listen to what the, to the copy, to the text. You don't see many wild stallions anymore. No, it gets better. It gets better. No, you don't see many wild stallions anymore. And even if he did run off three of your best mares, he's one of the last of a wild and very singular breed. Come to where the flavor is. Come to Marlboro country. Hmm? No innuendo. None. Zero. Okay, we can, oh, oop. okay. No, that's backward. No, we're not listening to this again. Okay, so, between the 80s and the 90s, companies began to cultivate the company brand, focusing on corporate identity, <laughs> vision, and value. So the company behind the product became the brand that they wanted people to become familiarized with. Now, in the 1920s, and between the 1920s and the 2010, we witnessed the digital revolution. By the end of the 1990s, internet is widely available, at least in Western countries. And in little over two decades, our entire way of communicating and interacting has completely changed. In terms of branding, this has had two major implications. The first one is that we are all brands now. We're all given a voice, a look and feel, a public persona. Through internet and social media, we can all become references and beacons. We all have access to a potential instantaneous limelight. But we are also open to unprecedented and unruly scrutiny and judgment and trolling, and bullying, and less privacy, which used to be only a famous people problem. I mean, no paparazzi were hanging out of my house, you know, 30 years ago. None are doing that now. You know, I had a stalker <laughs> once, but that's another talk. So now we can all kind of, you know, we're only a tweet away to become influencers. Don't we all want to become influencers now? No, but Many kids do. I can understand why. The second thing that has changed is that information is out there, people are watching, and you simply can't hide anywhere. Any one of you remember an old gentleman being dragged off you know, a Delta airline a couple of years ago? How quickly that went around? How poorly it did for the company? Um, so blunders are bigger because the world is watching and recording, and the news is instantaneous. So brands need to stay alert and on top of things to avoid scandals, which are a loss of equity. Remember the value? And they need to manage their reputation much more than they had to before. So branding has evolved. 
it went from establishing ownership to certify origin, quality, and authorship to distinguish one product from another, to differentiate products that were alike through emotions, to turning a brand into a company asset that has value, to imply status, and to represent reputation. So what's today? Today your brand is your capped promise to your customer. It's an exercise in trust building, and in clear communication. And to put it with Jeff Bezos, your brand is what other people say about you when you're not in the room. So, this is great, right? This is big company, marketing, offices. What about us? You know, freelancers, small folks, small companies, startups. Should we care about our branding? Yes. Absolutely, because of all the stuff I said before. So let me show you, let me give you a little how-to. And mind you, this is a blueprint to a brand, not a logo, although some things apply. First, you have to know yourself. It's hard to tell others what, what you do if it's not really clear to you. You need to know who your customer is and what value you provide for them. You need to know which pond you're swimming in. You need to know what your competition is doing and also understand what, what differentiates you from them. You need to have a vision. Uh, your goals, your purpose, where you want to go. It's like a map you need, that you need to follow. And you have to have values now more than ever, um, partially because the world watches and records and will remember, and partially because it's really not nice if you don't. You get to be like Mark Zuckerberg, and you know, that's, I mean, it has advantages, but. Um, you have to have a plan. Uh, this is like an intentional road trip, so you can't hack it. You need to give your brand an appropriate personality, and it's only now in the process that you get to work on your logo. And you can convey your brand personality through graphic design, and now we talk logo and symbol and colors, and the key here is consistency. Uh, and then you can use messages, the tone, tone of voice, and type of language. And here, you need to be coherent. Communication, how, where, in which way you communicate with, with your audience. And the key here is competence, because it's not something that you just know. You need to study and, and know about it. The attitude that you have with and towards your customer. And the key here, it's service. And while there's no need for big budgets, you do need to invest something. Like all valuable stuff, you need to work on it, adjust it if necessary, and keep working. <clears throat> Lastly, and though it's not mandatory, but it's like the ethics thing, it, it's nice if you can do this mindfully, you know, if you're aware of, you know, who you are, but also who's around you and what surrounds you, your people. So be present and be mindful. Now, what if you are a personal brand? Steps one through seven are the same. Rules nine through 11 are the same. Look-wise and look and feel-wise, you are your brand. It should have your personality. Be true to yourself. Now, since we'll be working with some nonprofits later on, I thought, it's use I thought it useful to share some tips on branding communicate communication and marketing for nonprofits. So first, your nonprofit is a business. If you look at it that way, you will enhance and strengthen your ability to fulfill the mission of your organization. Good <coughs> professional 
branding provides many opportunity. It allows, you, it allows your nonprofit to stand out and look professional. This helps create a sense of trust, loyalty, and engagement. And the better you promote it, the more you'll be able to help those in need that you work for. So it's a virtuous circle. So one, treat it professionally and respect the value of branding, marketing, and communication. Two, clearly define your values. They are your core and they are the reasons people will support you, be it volunteering or donating. Identify your stakeholders and your target so you can properly talk to them. Tell your story, be authentic and engaging, but be honest. Stay consistent, build and enforce brand guidelines. Make sure that every time your logo goes out somewhere, it's done properly. Make sure that if someone talks about you, it has the same tone of voice and so on. Exploit all opportunities you have to communicate. Be everywhere your audience is. A nonprofit does not mean non-income. So it's a business, just one with a better ethos. So, if this works, a brand is an organic, living and breathing being. One that, that needs care and nurturing so that it can grow and prosper and in a healthy way. Give it your best, love it, foster it, care for it. It's a valuable investment. And when you step on a poo, because it's inevitable, own it, apologize, fix it if you can, and learn from it. Thank you. Slides will be online at some point soon.